I was very active. I was tweeting a lot about like different things I was working on and um, blogging quite a bit. And they reached out to me on Twitter and said, you found a blog. It looks like you like Swift UI. <laughs> How about coming and working on it? I'm like, wow, that's that would be cool. Was it like a recruiter or was it the Apple account? No, on Twitter? it was it was no, it was Matt Rickerton, you know, the um the guy who works on Swift UI. Yeah, he was like come and work for our team. Welcome to another episode of the iOS Dev Podcast. Today's episode, I got to speak with Natalia. She's an iOS developer and a former Apple engineer. She's also an author and has her own blog. And I hope you guys enjoy this episode. I saw that you studied linguistics in university, right? Yes, I did. I did. I actually studied to be a teacher of French and English, but it oh. was a while ago. What what, uh, what got you into that? Um, I just liked French. So I thought, where, where can I study so I can learn French better? Yeah. And yeah, chose that, that university. And from there you went on to be a teacher, right? Um, actually, I wanted to be like a translator or interpreter and I tried teaching, but it felt very difficult for me. Um, that's why I like thought maybe I should like try something else. And my first full-time job was actually doing uh, localization for an app uh, for a Berlin startup called Kitchen Stories. Um, and like while I was working there, I started to be interested in tech more. So I thought maybe I should learn uh, to program uh, eventually. And yeah, that's how it started. Yeah. Also from that job at the startup, you you get, you get got an interest in tech. And then from there, where did, where did you go? Uh, I moved to Paris uh, from Berlin and I started looking for some courses where I could learn to program. And I found one in Paris du Jour University. It was in computational linguistics. Thought it would be a perfect match for me. Uh, and I got in touch with a the professor there. And because I moved just a little bit too late for the first year of the program, the program would be like three years all in total. He invited me to attend uh, the classes of like the first year without being officially enrolled. So that then I could apply for like the first year of masters straight away. So I got quite lucky. And it's how I learned uh, to program initially. It was quite fun because uh, like my mother tongue is Russian and uh, like uh, I spoke English usually like in, in life, but uh, I was uh, learning to program in French, <laughs> which was quite fun. <laughs> oh, <my God>. oh, <laughs> wow. But yeah, it, it was nice. And I learned uh, Java first and then Python. And it was mostly like classical algorithms and data structures and um, yeah, some uh, automaton theory and like everything useful for uh, computational linguistics. Yeah. Wait, so what exactly is computational linguistics? Uh, so it comprises like a few things, uh, natural um, language processing, for example. Um, so like speech recognition and oh. yeah, things like that. Also like more of the machine learning stuff? Yes, yes. Mm. And it's more like use... natural language processing, basically making computers yeah. understand human language. If you can put it that oh. way. Also, oh, you were you were doing that before uh, AI and machine learning got super popular. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was like ten years ago or something. <laughs> and you guys use Java, you said? Uh, yeah, uh, like the first uh, language we started it was Java, and then uh, we also started Python, yeah. sort of just a little later, just like a couple of months later. From there, you went to web development, right? Yes, that's true. Okay. Because I found a job, <laughs> and it was more like web focused. It was also for an app, for a Mac app. Um, Back then it was called Four, it was like a company in Paris. Uh, but recently it got bought by Rapid API. So it's called, I think, Rapid API HTTP client at the moment. And, but I wasn't working on the Mac app. Uh, I was mostly doing technical support and writing some extensions in JavaScript. And then I also started helping them out with front end. That's how I learned React. Um, yeah. Okay. So you juggled a lot of different technologies when you started. I did, yes. <laughs> What, was it hard or? Yes, it was really hard. <laughs> yeah, especially like I started learning React before I learned the basics of HTML and CSS. So it was a bit confusing for me. That's like why I was maybe I should learn like the basics uh, better. And I started looking for maybe boot camps or some other courses. And I found a web development boot camp uh, in Lisbon. It was called Lovagon. And it, uh, it exists in multiple countries. Uh, and yeah, that I, I did uh, two two months or uh, intensive web development bootcamp. 
what caused the shift from web development to iOS? Um, I was exploring different options after the bootcamp because uh, I felt like it was uh, learning Ruby on Rails and I felt like it wasn't quite right for me because I, I found Ruby a bit confusing after Java because it wasn't like as rigid and structural because it's not uh, strongly typed. Uh, so I was looking maybe going back to front-end development and then I tried iOS because I thought maybe I can like build an app on my own. Uh, I tried React na Native briefly, but it felt like I couldn't get like far enough with it. Like the app wouldn't be polished enough. So I thought maybe I should try learning iOS development. And uh, yeah, I started learning Swift and it felt natural to me. Like it was strongly typed, but sort of more flexible than Java maybe. Around what year was this? Um, 2016 maybe, 2017. Oh, like the early days of Swift then. Yeah, yeah. For most of UI kit then, I'm yes, assuming, yes. right? Yes, Swift UI didn't exist back then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like maybe a couple of years, yes. Uh, I think Swift UI was announced 2019, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was a couple of years before before it was announced. And and you found um, iOS and Swift and you didn't you didn't look back? Yes, I didn't look back. Well, actually, then I moved to New Zealand and I found like I was searching for an iOS job. I had maybe like a year of experience working on my own and building like my own apps. So I was looking for maybe more like junior or like mid-level uh, position in iOS. Uh, but the job I found in the end was full stack. So I did iOS and web at the same time. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I worked there for a year and I was like, no, I just want to do iOS in the end. Uh, and uh, yeah, I started working on my own projects. Uh, that's when I started my blog as well. And it's when Swift UI was announced. So it's got a perfect timing. I was, yeah, I was what, there um, from the beginning. What inspired you to start the blog? Um, I was learning a lot about Swift UI, but there was not much documentation, especially during the first year. And I thought, maybe it would be helpful for other people if I share what I learned by experimenting. And it got quite popular because people were like encountering the same problems. And yeah, that's, that's how it developed from there. How do you go about like creating blog posts? Is it just things you're working on? Yeah, I mostly, I try not to have a schedule uh, just because I don't want to force it and like write about something that like I haven't worked on uh, per se or something that like didn't didn't come up naturally. So I just, whenever I solve a problem um, and I feel like it's worth sharing, I, I write a post about it. And how did you feel when, when it started gaining a lot of traction? Uh, I felt like I need to write more. I was like really yeah. excited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause now, now I see a lot of people recommend it to uh, like early, early and junior devs. Oh, that's, that's nice to hear. Yeah. I, I recently haven't been publishing that often just because I recently, recently started a new job and look into my house. So it like takes a lot of time, but, uh, I have a few, a few drafts. So yeah, uh, yeah, I, I hope to, to keep it active. How did you end up, um, getting the job at Apple? Um, I was very active. I was tweeting a lot about like different things I was working on and um, blogging quite a bit and they reached out to me on Twitter and said, you found your blog. It looks like you like Swift UI. <laughs> How about coming and working on it? I'm like, wow, that, that would be cool. Was it like a recruiter or was it the Apple account? No, on Twitter? it was, it was, no, it was Matt Rickerton, you know, the, um, the guy who works on Swift UI. Yeah. He was like, come and work for our team. Well, if you want to like go through like the interviews and everything, but yeah, if you're interested, we can start the process. I'm like, yes. Let's start the process. Oh, wow. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> Were you excited? Yes, I was really excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause as an iOS developer, that's, that's like, um, that's one of the pinnacles. I would say like either you either, either working at Apple or like building an app that millions of people use. Yeah. That's like one of the, I would say like top aspirations of most developers. <laughs> yes, for sure. And it was a nice, you know, to be um, on a video call, like for the interview with them and seeing all of those like familiar faces that I knew from WWC videos <laughs> interviewing me. Oh, really? <laughs> were, were you nervous or? Yes, of course I was, yeah. <laughs> and 
after going through that process. Yeah, it took a while. Yeah, it took a while because uh, like I was working remotely from New Zealand and the process had to like involve hiring me through a New Zealand subsidiary of Apple, even though like I was, uh, my team was mostly in the US. Uh, but yeah, in the end I got the offer. It took maybe like three months, the whole process. Um, yeah, from the interview until I started. Oh, dang. Three months? Yeah. Well, that, that is pretty long. <laughs> yeah, and I had to, uh, I had to close my company, the one I opened here, uh, for like, my apps because Apple doesn't allow uh, to work on your own projects or have any sort of software development company if you work for Apple at the same time. So I had to close everything off and finalize everything oh, wow. before I could start. Did did you have to stop the blog or just was it just the app the app stuff? Yeah, I had to stop everything. Um, yeah, I, I transferred the app I was working on to my husband so he could continue maintaining it. Just stopped publishing on the blog, removed my name basically from the end of the day. <laughs> was working at Apple like secretive? Because from the outside, it seems like, like it could be very secretive. Like they don't allow a lot of stuff to get out and you have to true, be. Yes. It was, it was very secretive. I struggled with it a lot because like I used to share in everything I work on, everything I learn sort of motivates me. So it was really hard for me not to be able to share anything, uh, for at least like a year until it's released. Um, yeah. And what, what team did you work on? Uh, Swift, UI, right? Swift UI, yeah. So um, I'm not sure how it is at the moment, but when I worked there, uh, we had a core Swift UI team and we were mostly working on iOS and the core technology of Swift UI. And then we had a macOS uh, Swift UI team and a watchOS Swift UI team and a tvOS Swift UI team. But we all like worked really close together, uh, but had different managers. So currently, do you like develop and see some of like the features you implemented when you're working yeah. with Swift UI? Yeah, yes, I do. It was uh, quite nice last year, and because I worked for most of the cycle, and I just left Apple just like a month before WWDC, so I knew a lot of features uh, that were coming out. It was like I worked on them, or I was helping uh, with them. So it was really, really exciting to just like wait for a month and see all of my work come out and be able to use it in a real project straight away. You said you left before w uh, WWDC. Last year, yes, I left last April. So yeah. Wait, did you get to experience like a WWDC though as an employee or no? I did, yes. Uh, the previous one, uh, 2021. Yeah, yeah, 2021. How was that? I'm assuming it's a little different because COVID and everything was like remote. Yeah, it was. Everything did, like, was remote. Did it shut down or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything was remote. And um, like, even though I helped prepare the sessions, uh, I couldn't present them uh, because I couldn't travel to the US to record them. Um, but yeah, it was really intense, the preparation, uh, for the WC and like the sessions and like finalizing the APIs and everything, but it was quite nice to be able to finally share what I was working on as well. Uh, when, when time came. So if you would have been working like from the office, you would have been able to record like a session. Yeah. yeah. Oh, then. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to like the other companies and other jobs you had, what do you think like the biggest difference was when working at Apple? Uh, I think you get a lot of autonomy um, for like what you're working on, basically just given some direction uh, of what like the direction for this particular year, for example, is and what you should focus on. But you decide on your own how it's going to come to life. You schedule all the meetings you need with other teams on your own. For example, I was working on text. Uh, in Swift UI, so I worked really closely with the foundation team because they developed the attributed string in Swift. So I had to manage all of that. I had to like know who I should be talking to to make sure my API is correct and integrates well with the other systems and uh, plan uh, all the work on my own. So plan the API, uh, plan the implementation and everything. So you get, uh, there is no like product managers, for example, on the team. So you plan everything on your own, you create your own tasks, you you plan your work for the year on your own. <laughs> they, give you, they give you a lot of responsibility then. Yes. And freedom. Yeah, it was really nice, very difficult and intense, but also like you get a lot of fulfillment once something comes out and you see like lots of developers use it. What advice would you have for any developers who want to work at Apple? Um, 
be like out there, be um, noticeable, I think. Easier probably to uh, get a job there if um, like Apple employees already know you so that you don't have to go through recruiters, uh, maybe at the initial stage. Uh, because I think Apple gets a lot of applications from like really good people. So uh, it might be hard to get past this initial stage of filtering the, the applications. Uh, also, uh, a lot of people who work at Apple are active on social media. So you, if they post about the job opening, just don't hesitate to reach out and don't think that you're not good enough or something. Just reach out and yeah, and see see where you can get. Yeah, I think that's, that's really good advice. And putting yourself out there, like as we saw, like you you had the blog and you were, you were active in the community. And that those two helped you get reached uh, reached out by them. Yeah, because I would have never applied on my own. I would have thought that I'm just not good enough for that, and uh, I I would not pass like the the filter. And that's why like, uh, yeah, being active and sort of sharing my work um, meant that they reached out to me, and uh, and this like gave me confidence to take the interviews and get the job in the end. Yeah. So if there's any developers out there who are thinking about maybe starting a blog or creating some sort of iOS content and they definitely should. Yeah, it's for sure. What do you think the most underrated or undervalued part of Swift UI is by the way? Maybe the simplicity of it. Um, yeah. And I think many developers are trying to fight it and maybe they expect to work more like UI kit rather than like going with it and um, because the team of putting like the, the Swift, the Swift UI team is putting a lot of effort into, uh, making sure it does the right thing by default is that if it's like, if it's difficult to do something, maybe, maybe you shouldn't <laughs> like not necessarily all the time, because sometimes it's just like some APIs are just missing. Uh, but sometimes they're not there on purpose because, well, the recommendation from Apple is not to do something this way. Um, so yeah, just try to sort of work with it and uh let let's if i do the right thing by default yeah yeah coming from because i was doing a lot of ui kit up until earlier this year and when i first transitioned to swift ui I, w I was fighting it a little bit i was like where's the auto layout where where i was trying to code the same way you do in ui kit but you kind of have to change your paradigm and once you do that it's a lot easier and and it's really it's really simple as you said yeah, yeah, and I found SwiftUI easier for me straight away, but maybe because I started with a React and I found just a little bit similar. Um, because like uh, UI kit is a bit too verbose for me, maybe. <laughs> like you have to uh, declare all the things yeah. and like do a lot of work because before you see the result. What do you think makes a good iOS app? Um, the design is very important, I think. And it's what I keep hearing from Apple as well that uh, that's probably one of the most important parts of the app is a good design, good UX. Uh, it has to have this a surprise and delight thing. Uh, like, so that's like really exciting for users to use it and they are looking forward to opening it. Uh, and of course it should function well, should respect user settings, be accessible, should respect user privacy, not share like data um, with any random companies or anything like that. Which, which you think is more important design or functionality? I feel both are important, but I think it's more important to focus on the design because users might not be able to take full advantage of the functionality if it's really difficult to use or if, um, yeah, when I talk about design, I feel like it's not just the visual, but also the UX, uh, like how, uh, how easy it is to use the app. Uh, how intuitive it is, how accessible it is. Like if, if it doesn't respect, for example, uh, the font settings and you simply can't see properly like the letters, they won't be able to take full advantage of the functionality of the app. Yeah, yeah that's true. And what was your inspiration behind, uh, is it Exo that the, or Exto, the app that you have on, on the app store? Yes. Um, so we, so we're playing around with the idea of creating some uh, app that helps you to create art without knowing first what you want to create. Uh, just because um, like me and my husband were like, 
sort of experimenting with different drawing apps, but we always found really hard to the, go past the initial state where you have to plan your drawing in advance. And it's really hard um, to find the inspiration for that. Uh, so we created Extra, which is sort of helps you a little bit uh, by creating a sort of semi-randomized shapes where you can find inspiration, maybe see some forms that you didn't plan to create and just emphasize them. Um, so we found it would be easier for us to to create some artworks and just to, to sort of relax uh, and play around with it. Um, yeah, and we tweaked the algorithm to, yeah, to have a little bit of a control of what you're creating, but also uh, have a bit of randomness to it. Uh, and once we were happy with it, um, yeah, we released it. Yeah, I played around with a, with it a little bit. And what do you guys use to get those shapes? Is is it is it like randomly preset or? Uh, yes, it's just a, an algorithm that creates those shapes depending on your velocity and uh, yeah, how fast you move depends on what direction uh, and the noise level you can um, tweak. So it like basically multiplies the, the points by by the noise and the velocity and gets those shapes drawn. And what are your guys' future plans or are you thinking of, uh, are you guys switching to a different one, like a different app focusing on Yes, that? yes, we are working on a new project. Uh, it's in early stages, so hoping to share it um, soon, but also uh, working on improving extra. So we recently released a version that supports iPhone uh, as well, just because not everyone has an iPad or easier to try out on iPhone first before you go ahead and, and install it on your iPad. Uh, and um, trying to make it more accessible as well um, so that more people can try it out. Um, yeah, uh, maybe maybe it will come out on Vision Pro at some point. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh yeah, that, that'd be interesting. Yeah, um, but otherwise, yeah, we have a couple of uh, projects we're also working on uh, some new ideas. And what are, your, what are your thoughts on Vision Pro? Um, I feel like I need to try it out the physical device before I can make um, sort of an informed, uh, yeah, um, opinion about that. But it, I was really excited to see it, and uh, like the demo was really cool. And I was a bit sad that it's not going to come out in New Zealand for a while, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hoping that we can apply for a developer kit. Not sure how it's going to work at, at all at the moment. Uh, and I wonder the price too. Cause, yes, cause... yeah, it's really expensive. Well, I don't know if you can say, but while you were working at Apple, did you hear any rumors of the Vision Pro or Vision Can't OS? Say much about no. it. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> uh, let's shift gears to the book that you recently released. It's, it's about transitioning your app from UI Kit to Swift UI, correct? That's correct. Or just um, add some Swift UI code within your app. So. Uh, I wanted to write something focusing on UIKit developers uh, who have existing UIKit projects um, because many of them would still like to keep uh, the existing projects, of course, and maintain them. And it's like it would take a lot of time to fully rewrite an application in a different framework. So I thought maybe uh, I should write something to help UIKit developers to play around with SwiftUI, try it out in small uh, parts of their apps. And it would also enable them to take advantage of new functionality that is not available in UIKit, for example, Swift charts. So the book is structured in a way that uh, you don't need to have any Swift UI knowledge to start to start it. Uh, so the first chapter just focuses on uh, introducing Swift UI uh, for for people who already have experience developing apps in UIKit. Uh, and then uh, it shows you different ways you can use Swift UI APIs in your existing UIKit project uh, in a view or view controller or in a table of yourself. Uh, and the last chapter uh, focuses on switching uh, to Swift UI as the main framework of your, but still being able to bring some pieces of your existing UIKit code along. So that you don't, again, even if you switch to Swift UI uh, app lifecycle, you can still reuse some of the com components you had uh, in UIKit. What do you typically see as the biggest issue when transitioning parts of your app or the the full app? I think UI? the the most common question I get is how to integrate SwiftUI within um, table of your cells on 
like earlier versions of the OS because the official support uh, for this with the UI hosting configuration came out last year only. Um, so, and the official answer is it's better not to because it's really hard to make sure you're not leaking any memory if you try to embed hosting uh, controllers within table cells. Um, yeah, that's, I think, one of the uh, biggest problems because uh, if you do want to use 50i in table view cells and support earlier versions of iOS, then you probably need to have two uh, configurations, one in UI kit for older versions and one in 50i for newer versions. And how was writing the book? Was it a little easier since you're used to blogging or how was that process for you? Yes, it was maybe a little easier, but it was much harder than just writing a blog post because I thought, mm, why not write a book? It's just uh, multiple blog posts put together, but yeah. no, it's not because you have to make it like, coherent. Uh, so it's sort of a much la larger undertaking and it was harder than I expected. Um, and it took a little longer than I expected, uh, but I'm pleased with the result in the end. How long did it take, if you don't mind me asking? So just writing full time, maybe two and a half months, but not working on anything else, not going for walks, just writing the book. Uh, but of course, I had a lot of different like uh, drafts that I could also uh, use while doing that. Are you looking to write any more books in the future? Yes, I have. Uh, I have been working uh, with a draft for Swift charts uh, and another one for push notifications, uh, but they're in early stages. And because I just have a little bit less time, I can't, like, I don't have these two, two and a half months now that I can just fully focus on a book. Uh, it might take me a while to, uh, to finalize them, but yes, definitely planning to write some more. What are you most excited about for the future of Swift UI? Yeah, I hope it gets more functionality. So we need to use UI kit less and less, especially um, more flexibility around um, text input, hopefully. Um, yeah, because I, um, like, I, I used to like working on developer tools uh, and uh, like I worked on four and then uh, I wrote my own app for as a WebSocket client for developers to sort of test uh, WebSocket connections uh, with the UI. And uh, all of those apps involved working with text uh, inputs, like text editors, and at the moment is just no way to write in Swift UI. So I hope we get more, more sort of uh, richer APIs around that. Um, yeah, and less bugs, hopefully as well, because sometimes uh, I create something and it just doesn't work as I expect. And I will think, is it me or is it Swift UI? And sometimes hard <laughs> to understand. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> And have you played around with the new iOS 17 frameworks? Yes, I did a little bit, especially um, the new observable um, framework and how much nicer it is and creating observable objects. And uh, now we need much less um, property wrappers, which I think will be like really beneficial for newcomers to SwiftUI because I think it was probably one of the most confusing parts of SwiftUI to know which property wrapper to use where. And now we just have like yeah. three, I think in the end, which like cuts them uh, a lot. So I think that's really exciting. Yeah, that's true because we had like the state object, the mm -hmm. observed object and the environment object. <laughs> yes, I have like a big, uh, a big chapter in my book explaining all of that, like the data flow. And I'm like, oh, I have to update it now for, uh, yeah going to be much simpler, but I will keep, I will keep the, the, the sort of the legacy, um, the legacy part there too, just because yeah, uh, observable will only work on, on iOS 17. And you mentioned your husband is a develop developer. Is he, he's also an iOS developer? Yes. Uh, he's full stack as well. Uh, and, um, he has more experience in backend development, uh, Django and Python but he, he's also an iOS developer and a macOS developer. Was he that, was he in the, uh, iOS and macOS before he met you or? No, no, we launched it together you? actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we had this idea yeah. for an app and we're like, okay, let's learn iOS developers together to, to uh, make this app. <laughs> was it the current app you're working on or was it a different idea? No, it was that uh, WebSocket client uh, that we initially planned to make for macOS. 
uh, but because there are so many more resources for iOS like development to start learning, we thought maybe we can just start by making an iOS app for iPad first, and then once we like have it, we bring it to Mac because it would be much harder to start with Mac OS first. Yeah. But then, it, because like there was no Swift UI, so we'd have to learn AppKit, and there were just no resources to learn it uh, back then. And yeah, but then we like rewrote it on Swift UI, and now we took it down from the App Store just because we didn't have time to maintain it, and because it uses a lot of navigation and like text input and navigation, and it kept breaking every time there was an update in Swift UI, uh, because it used like a lot of complicated custom navigation. So, but we get a lot of people writing to us asking where, where this app is because they wanted to download it and it's not there. So we, we will hopefully bring it back again just as we get time to develop it again. And I heard that you've, you've lived a lot of places, right? Yes, yes, we did. We started by living in Ireland. It was like just after the uni. Uh, and then, uh, so then we moved to Berlin. Uh, we lived in Berlin for a bit and then we moved to Paris. And after Paris, Sort of went wandering, <laughs> wandering, went to Thailand and then to Lisbon because I had my boot camp there and we went to Budapest for a bit. And then, uh, yeah, then we were in France, I think, again for a bit. And then we, in the end, ended up in New Zealand. And we've been here for five years now. So hopefully it's our final, final place to, to settle. What, what was your favorite place throughout that whole time? Um, I think, like, obviously New Zealand because it's where I want to, uh, to stay. But, uh, but, Think about Europe. I think Lisbon probably was my favorite place in Europe. Just because of uh, maybe because I was in the boot camp there, and there were lots of people from different countries with similar interests, and we just like had a great time. But also the the city felt really vibrant. And is, is yeah. it on the beach, yeah. right? Uh, yes, yes, it's by the ocean. Yeah, oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Where can the people find you? Uh, so I'm still active on Twitter, uh, and they can find me at Nat Panferova. The same uh, on Mastodon. Uh, I'm on Mastodon.cloud, uh, and obviously on my blog, they can also reach out uh, by email. They can find it on, on my website, neocoalescing.com. Yeah, that's that's pretty much me. Oh, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Natalia Panferova, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for listening. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe and also check out some of the other episodes with other fellow developers. And if you've been enjoying all these episodes and if you've been enjoying all these episodes, hit me up on Twitter. I'd like to see what you guys think and also consider joining the Patreon.